Let me share something powerful with you, something that, if done correctly, can bring profound changes. The title of this video is, Write These Words and Don't Tell Anyone About It, and it's all about how you can use a simple technique to change your reality. So what's the big idea here? It's quite simple. The act of writing can be incredibly transformative, but there's a specific way to use writing to harness the power of your mind and create the life you want. It's a process that involves more than just jotting down your thoughts. It's about creating a new reality through a focused, intentional practice. Here's the first thing you need to understand. Our thoughts and feelings create our reality. This is not just a spiritual concept. It's backed by science. When you think about something, you generate an electromagnetic field around you. Your thoughts send out signals into the quantum field, and your feelings create a magnetic field that attracts experiences to you. This is why it's so important to be mindful of what you're thinking and feeling. Now let's get into the technique I want to share with you. It's a simple but powerful method to help you start creating the reality you want. Here's what you need to do. Take out a piece of paper and a pen. This is a crucial step because writing things down helps to make them more real and concrete. On this piece of paper, write down a specific statement. This statement should reflect the reality you want to create in your life. Think about what you truly desire or what you want to change. Your statement should be positive and clearly state what you want as if it's already happening. For example, let's say you have a goal of becoming more successful in your career. Instead of just writing, I want to be successful, make your statement more detailed and positive. You could write, I am successful in my career and living a life of abundance. This statement tells your brain exactly what you want and sets a clear intention. Or perhaps you want to improve your health and overall happiness. Instead of saying, I want to be healthy and happy, write something like, I am healthy, happy, and thriving in every aspect of my life. This statement captures not just your goal, but also the positive feelings you want to experience. When writing your statement, try to be as specific as possible. The more detailed your statement, the better. For instance, if you want to manifest a new opportunity, you might write, I am excited to have found a new job that perfectly matches my skills and passions, and I am thriving in this new role. This level of detail helps you to visualize and feel the reality of your goal. Once you've written your statement, read it out loud several times. This helps to reinforce the message in your mind. As you read it, really feel the emotions associated with achieving your goal. Imagine what it would be like if your statement were true right now. Visualize the success, the happiness, or the abundance you're describing. The more you can connect with the emotions of your statement, the more effective this technique will be. It's also helpful to keep your written statement somewhere you can see it often. This could be on your desk, your fridge, or your bedroom wall. By placing it in a visible spot, you remind yourself of your goals and keep your focus on them throughout the day. But here's the crucial part. After you write down this statement, keep it to yourself. Don't share it with anyone. Why? Because when you keep your intention private, you're protecting its energy. Sharing your goals or dreams with others can sometimes lead to unwanted opinions or judgments that can dilute your intention. By keeping it private, you allow your desire to develop and gain strength without outside interference. So, what happens after you write this statement? You need to focus on it. Read it every day. Let it become a part of your consciousness. When you read it, do so with feeling and emotion. Visualize yourself living the reality you've written down. Imagine the sights, sounds, and feelings associated with your new reality. The more vividly you can imagine it, the more real it becomes to your subconscious mind. But here's where many people go wrong. They write down their goals and then become discouraged if they don't see immediate results. Change doesn't happen overnight, and the process of creating a new reality requires patience and persistence. The key is to keep your focus on your written statement and maintain a positive emotional connection to it. Our brains are amazing organs that are constantly changing and adapting. 
One of the key ways they do this is through a process called neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity means that our brain can change its structure and function based on our experiences and repeated activities. This is important because it helps us understand how our thoughts and emotions can affect our brain and in turn our ability to achieve our goals. When you focus on something consistently, like a goal or a desired outcome, your brain starts to respond in a powerful way. Imagine you have a goal, such as wanting to get a new job or improve your health. If you keep thinking about this goal and feeling positive emotions about it, your brain starts to change. It creates new pathways and connections that help you move towards that goal. This is because your brain is wired to respond to repetitive thoughts and emotions. Here's how it works. When you think about something frequently, those thoughts become stronger in your mind. If you're always imagining yourself achieving your goal, like landing that dream job or being healthier, you're reinforcing those thoughts. This consistent focus helps your brain create new neural pathways. Neural pathways are like roads in your brain that connect different areas. The more you use these pathways, the stronger they become. For example, if you constantly think about how you want to be healthier, your brain starts to form new connections related to health. You might find yourself more motivated to exercise or make better food choices. These new habits become easier to adopt because your brain is now wired to support them. The more you focus on your desired outcome, the more your brain adjusts to make that outcome a reality. It's similar to practicing a skill. If you practice playing the piano every day, you become better at it because your brain is learning and adapting. Similarly, when you focus on positive outcomes and your goals, your brain rewires itself to help you achieve them. Moreover, when you maintain this focus, you're also engaging in what I call coherent brainwave states. These states are achieved when your brain waves slow down, allowing you to access deeper levels of consciousness. In this state, you're more likely to make the changes needed to align with your new reality. But remember, it's not just about thinking positively. It's also about feeling good and being in alignment with your new reality. If you're still holding on to old negative emotions or past traumas, they can block your progress. This is why it's important to work on your emotional state as well. Practice gratitude, forgiveness, and self-love. These practices help to clear out old emotional patterns and make way for new, positive experiences. Another important point to remember is to avoid getting too caught up in the how. This means you should not become overly obsessed with the details of how your desires will come true. It's a common mistake for people to want to know every single detail of how things will happen. They might worry about the exact steps or timeline for achieving their goals. This focus on the how can often lead to frustration and stress because it's something that is out of our direct control. When you have a goal or a desire, it's natural to think about how it might happen. You might wonder about the exact path you need to take or the specific actions you need to follow. But here's the key. You don't need to figure out every detail of the process. Your main job is to focus on the end result what you want to achieve or manifest. Imagine you want to achieve something significant, like a new job, a better relationship, or a new home. It's fine to have a vision of what you want. For example, if you want a new job, you might picture yourself working in a specific role, in a particular company, or in a certain industry. That's great. Hold on to that vision and let it guide you. However, stressing over how exactly you will get that job is not helpful. You might think you need to network with specific people, apply for certain positions, or follow particular steps. While planning and taking action are important, getting overly fixated on the details of how it will all happen can create unnecessary stress and anxiety. It's important to let go of trying to control every aspect of the process. Instead, focus on the outcome you want. Visualize it. Feel the emotions associated with achieving it, and stay positive and open to possibilities. When you let go of trying to control the how, you allow space for the universe to work in ways that you might not have expected or planned for. 
the universe or whatever you believe in has a way of bringing opportunities and resources into your life in ways that might be beyond your imagination. This doesn't mean you should sit back and do nothing. Taking inspired actions is still important. It means that instead of being stuck in worry or overthinking, you take the steps that feel right and necessary. When you stay focused on your end goal and remain open to how it will unfold, you are more likely to notice and seize the opportunities that come your way. Trust that the process will work out. Sometimes the path to achieving your desires is not straightforward. It might involve twists and turns, or it might happen in a way that you didn't expect. Trusting the process means having faith that things are moving in the right direction, even if you can't see all the details. Think of it like planting a seed. When you plant a seed, you don't know exactly how it will grow or what the exact process will be. You water it, provide the right environment, and then you wait. The seed grows in its own time and in its own way. The same applies to your desires. Once you've set your intention and taken some steps, trust that things will grow and develop as they should. Here's an important aspect to remember. If you find yourself feeling stuck or discouraged, it's crucial to address these feelings. Ask yourself why you're feeling this way and what might be blocking your progress. Often these feelings are a sign that you need to do some inner work. It might be that you have limiting beliefs or unresolved issues that need to be addressed. Take the time to reflect on these feelings and work through them. This might involve meditation, journaling, or seeking guidance from a mentor or therapist. The goal is to clear out any emotional blocks that are preventing you from moving forward. As you keep practicing this technique, you'll begin to notice some changes in your life. These changes might start out small, but they are important signs that your reality is starting to shift in the direction you want. You might see things starting to align with your goals or notice little improvements in your daily life. For example, you might see small opportunities popping up that you hadn't expected before. Maybe you get a chance to meet someone who could help you with your goals, or you find that you're getting closer to achieving something you've been working towards. These little signs are like clues that your practice is having an effect and that things are starting to move in the right direction. Another change you might experience is a sense of inner peace and confidence. As you focus on your positive statement and keep your mind on your goals, you might start feeling more calm and sure of yourself. This sense of peace and confidence is a great indicator that your mind is aligning with your goals and that you are moving towards creating the reality you want. When you notice these small victories, it's important to celebrate them. Even if they seem minor, they are steps in the right direction and show that your efforts are paying off. Celebrating these achievements helps to reinforce your positive mindset and encourages you to continue with your practice. It's like giving yourself a pat on the back for the progress you've made. The journey of creating a new reality is ongoing. It's not a one-time event, but a continuous process. Keep refining your practice, stay focused on your goals, and remain open to the possibilities that the universe presents to you. The technique of writing down your desired reality and keeping it private is a powerful tool for creating change. By focusing on your written statement, maintaining a positive emotional state, and trusting the process, you can transform your life in profound ways. It requires patience, persistence, and a willingness to do the inner work necessary to align with your new reality. So, take out that piece of paper, write down your statement, and keep it to yourself. Make it a part of your daily practice, a neurological, a genetic, a chemical death of the old self. And this dark night of the soul, this unfamiliar place, is the true value, the true step towards developing a new self. So then if we're leaving the old and we are creating the new, then the next most important question is, well, if I'm going to create a new self, what thoughts do I want to think? What behaviors can I plan? And as you begin to image and rehearse a new way of being, you are changing your brain and body neurologically and biologically. That's the neuroscientific model of mental rehearsal. 
and as we begin to remind ourselves who we no longer want to be, and we remind ourselves every day of who we do want to be, there'll come a moment where we begin to silence the circuits in our brain that are connected to the old self and inhibit the chemicals that reaffirm the same identity and then begin to fire and wire new circuits in our brain that begins to install the neurological hardware. The knowledge creates awareness. Awareness creates consciousness. Consciousness and energy are connected. So there's a change in energy globally going on with the world. Now that knowledge and that change of energy has effects on paradigms that are no longer a vibrational match with that new level of consciousness. This is the time we've been waiting for. This is where it's happening in the Milky Way. This is happening here because there's a true coming of a new consciousness. It's not one person that's coming. It's a collective consciousness that's emerging. If you look around the world right now, whether you're looking at the economic model or the political model, or even certain aspects of the religious model, the environment, the medical model, there's several different parts of our culture that's beginning to collapse. If you study human nature historically, we always wait for crisis or trauma or disease or diagnosis, both as an individual and as a culture, before we decide to change. If you look at this and you study it in history, it's a sign that something new has to be born. As the old model of reality begins to change, something else has to replace it. So we have two ways that we actually face crisis. We can either face crisis in a state of emergency, which in the beginning of a crisis is healthy, or we can face crisis in a state of creativity and innovation. If you're addressing a financial crisis or a crisis in a culture and everybody is selfish and everybody's living by those emotions, then they're pushing their way to get to the head of the line. They're competing. They're forcing outcomes. They're using very primitive systems to try to take care of themselves. We know from the physiology of the brain that most of the blood supply goes to the hind brain and away from the forebrain. Those chemicals create a gap between the way things appear in our life and the way things really are. In other words, we're viewing reality in an altered state. We don't see possibility. We feel separate from each other. We are competing and striving to get to the head of the line by using our cunning, manipulative, egocentric ways to get there, and we're very controllable. Fear is very controllable. Competition is very controllable. Anger and war divides individuals. Now that is not a way to address a crisis because the service to self or taking care of the self is the exact thing that enhances the crisis. Because if you and I are all doing the same, if we're all doing the same thing, then a culture becomes more divided. It becomes more disintegrated. It becomes more incoherent. And possibility then is not part of the equation. So the other state of mind, if you can view crisis as a great opportunity brilliantly disguised as an impossible situation, and you have to match the conditions in your environment with a new mind, now we're talking about greatness. Because innovation and creativity and a new way of thinking and a new way of being means that we can't do the same thing from the past. And so in history, cultures that are individuals that overcame their environmental conditions were considered mystics and saints and leaders and charismatic leaders. They were individuals that saw past the illusion of the present reality. When we begin to become innovative or creative, the brain begins to switch. We begin to turn on the forebrain, the frontal lobe, which is really the crowning achievement of the human being, and we begin to ask bigger questions. How can we create a new way of being in a world that's falling apart? How can we begin to create a new system to adapt to these conditions? And I think that people, when they begin to feel empowered by possibility, when they begin to see that the death of the old paradigms means the beginning of a new paradigm, how many people actually believe in the idea that the way you think has some effect on your life? So how many people actually woke up this morning and consciously created a future? You know, the biggest reason why people don't do it is because you don't really believe it's true. You see, 
If you knew on a gut level that it was absolutely true, would you ever miss a day and would you ever let any thought slip by your awareness that you didn't want to experience? So your brain, according to neuroscience, is organized to reflect everything you know in your life. Your brain is a record of your environment. It's a record, an artifact of your past. So if you believe this then, then does your environment control your thinking or does your thinking control your environment? So if you wake up in the morning and you get out of bed on the same exact side as you did the day before, you shut the alarm clock off with the same finger, you slip into your favorite slippers, you shuffle into the bathroom and you use the toilet like you always do, then you walk over to the mirror and you look at yourself to remember who you are, then you get into the shower and you wash yourself in the same routine way, then you groom yourself to look like everybody expects you to look, then you go downstairs and you drink coffee out of your favorite mug, then you drive to work the same way as you did the day before. You see the same people that push the same emotional buttons. You do the exact thing that you know how to do and you memorize and can do so well that you're an expert at. Then you hurry up and rush home so you can hurry up and check your emails, so you can hurry up and go to bed, so you can hurry up and do it all over again. Now here's my question. Did your brain change at all that day? We could say that you were thinking the same thoughts, performing the same actions that create the same experiences that produce the same emotions, but secretly expecting something to change in your life. So then, as the environment turns on different circuits in your brain, you begin to think equal to your environment. As you see the same people and go to the same places and do the same things at the same time, it's the external environment that's turning on different circuits in your brain, causing you to think equal to everything that you know. And as long as you think equal to everything that's familiar or known to you, what do you keep creating more of? Same life, same laws still applying to you. You're just thinking equal to everything that you know and you keep creating more of the same. To change, to truly change, is to think greater than your environment. And every great person in history knew this. Whether it was William Wallace, or Mahatma Gandhi, or Martin Luther King, or Queen Elizabeth I, or Joan of Arc, they all had a vision. They all had an idea, couldn't see it, couldn't smell it, couldn't taste it, couldn't feel it. It was alive in their mind. It was so alive in their mind that they began to live as if that reality was actually happening now. So can you believe in a future that you can't see or experience with your senses yet, but you've thought about enough times in your mind that your brain is literally changed to look like the event has already happened? Neuroscience says it's absolutely possible. Now your personality, your personality creates your personal reality. That's it. It's that simple. And your personality is made up of how you think, how you act, and how you feel. So the present personality who's sitting here today, you, has created the present personal reality called your life. The hardest part of all of this, everything we're talking about, is one simple thing. Making the time to do it. That's it making the time for your precious self to eliminate the people in your life and the things that you do just for a short period of time when you wake up in the morning or before you go to bed at night and you say, okay, what is the greatest ideal of myself that I want to be today? But listen, I'm not gonna get up until I am this person. When you begin to wrestle with your limitations and overcome them, you know, there's so much talk in the United States about self-love. People think self-love is getting a manicure or buying a sports car. That's not self-love, that's pleasure. Self-love is when you're sitting with yourself and you are working on overcoming your hardwired thoughts or beliefs or your emotional propensities that are connected to your past and you are really working to overcome them. Right on the other side of your pain is freedom. Right on the other side of your fear is courage. Right on the other side of your sadness is joy. It's the same energy. It's just trapped in the body. When you stretch yourself past that point and you break free from the chains of those emotional addictions, the side effect of that is called joy. The body is liberated from that level of mind. When that happens, there's available energy to create with. 
So when you break through that, you begin to love yourself. You begin to respect yourself and you begin to love and respect others because you see yourself in them. And now that you're free from it, you can understand them with compassion without knee jerking in the same way. So the difficulty here is really making the time to do it. And if you began to think about a new way of being and you moved into a state where you said, I'm not going to get up until I am this person. Not only did you memorize it neurologically in your brain, but you allowed the thoughts that you were thinking to become the experience to the point that your body as the unconscious mind began to live in that future reality in the present moment. And when you got up when mind and body were working together in that state of being, and you said, I'm gonna maintain the state of being my entire day, and I don't care. Bring on the challenges because I want to test my greatness. And you did that the entire day. The end of your day, when you finished your day, more than likely, you'd have more energy than when you started. The literal translation of the word meditation in Tibetan means to become familiar with. The symbol means to become familiar with. So if you're becoming conscious of or familiar with your unconscious self to the point you're so conscious of your unconscious thoughts, so familiar with your unconscious habits, and so aware of your emotions that you would never let them go by unnoticed by you. There's no chance for you to return back to the old self, to know thyself. And then if you became familiar with a new self because you neurologically fired and wired it in your brain and you emotionally conditioned your body and you were able to do it enough times, sooner or later it would get easier and it would become more familiar to you and you would be able to move into that state of being. By the way, a new state of being is a new personality and a new personality is a new personal reality. One of the things about substances is that it actually helps to change chemistry in the brain and body. So there becomes a chemical dependence on it at that point. But the person who wants to change has to want to change. That's the first element. In other words, no one can make you change, but you have to find it in you to really see if this is what you want to do. I've studied people over the last 12 years. Why is it that one person, an old timer, can look at his x-rays and see a spot on his lungs and the doctor will say to him, hey George, you know that's a spot on your lungs, it's nothing now, but if you keep smoking, it will be. And that guy just takes his cigarettes, throws them in the trash, and he's done the next day. How do you explain that? He made the decision and the decision was an experience and it began to rewrite his chemistry and his biology. How can a person who moves into a state of religious ecstasy, a state of absolute faith, drink strychnine and not get poisoned by it? It's a decision. It's an energetic decision. It's how powerful the mind really is. People then who actually want to make the decision to change have to make the decision with firm intention. Once you understand the how-to, that you can't use your conscious mind to do this, you have to move beyond the analytical mind. When you understand brainwave patterns, and when you slip into a different state of mind, that it's easier to do it. So most people then, you know, 95% of who we are by the time we're 35 years old, is a set of memorized habits and behaviors that become part of our identity or personality. So 5% of the conscious mind is trying to change 95% of what we've memorized, hardwired, become addicted to emotionally. So the person may want to think positively, but they've been feeling negatively and oiling those programs for the last 25 years. They might want a new life with new conditions, and as they use their mind, conscious mind, to focus on that, their subconscious mind, they've been programmed to feel guilty. That's mind and body in opposition. We have to begin to recondition the body to a new mind. So change isn't hard. It's just that you've got to get the manual to understand how to begin to unlearn and relearn, to break the habit of the old self and reinvent the new self. The latest research in neuroplasticity tells us we're not hardwired to be a certain way for the rest of our lives. 
the latest research in epigenetics says, we're not doomed by our genes, that in fact we're marvels of adaptability and change. So as a person started to contemplate and think about who do I want to be when I open my eyes, what would it be like to be happy? What would it be like to live a new life? The frontal lobe is looking out into the landscape of the entire brain because it has connections to the entire neocortex, and it's got to resolve the problem. So it starts calling up different networks of neurons that are relevant to the question based on the knowledge the person learns or the experiences that they had, and it begins to seamlessly piece together this new understanding, and that's called intention. And so if you're reading a book about how to become more happy, or if you're reading a book on how to be a leader in your life, where you're studying the process, every time you learn something new, you add new connections to your brains and raw materials for you to imagine even more. The act of mentally rehearsing begins to install the neurological hardware in your brain to look like it's already happened. Now, the brain is typically a record of the past, but the moment we install the neurological hardware, it becomes a map to the future. And you keep doing that, the hardware becomes a software program, which means you start thinking like a genius. You start acting like a happy person because there's no mystery there because you installed the circuits. And then these people didn't wait for their wealth or their health to feel gratitude and to feel empowered or to feel love, a love for life. They began to feel those emotions ahead of the experience and their body as the unconscious mind doesn't know the difference between the experience and their life that creates the emotion and their emotion that they're creating by thought alone. The body's believing it's living in the future, in the present moment, and the stronger the emotion that they felt, the more they're going to pay attention to the thoughts they're thinking, and now all of a sudden they're changing their biology from living in the past present reality to living in the future present reality. And I was so intrigued by this process that I went back to school to study neuroscience because it was the answer in the internal process of rehearsing and imagining.